as we know we are no longer thinking of post covid it's all about a covid world most of our assumptions about our customers are changing our understanding of our customers is changing in short our value chains which some call as fulfillment chains are mutating peter drucker said the best way to predict the future is to create it this has never been more relevant with this three thoughts and i'm sure that there will be many more thoughts and more significant thoughts i invite my colleague deborshi chaki to introduce the thought leaders of today over to you deborshi um thank you vinay joining us live this evening are some of india's best known names from the e-commerce industry each one of them an expert in their own right in the panel we have today mr hari menon co-founder and ceo of big basket one of india's largest online grocery platforms we have mr mohit tandon co-founder of delivery again one of india's largest e-commerce focus logistic players ms meena ganesh ceo and md of coty america which is also founded and backed many well known e-commerce ventures among other other businesses that she has founded and mr amar nagram who is the ceo of mintra one of india's leading online fashion stores but before we go to our stellar panel today let me first listen to let let, let us first listen to amit agarwal who is the country head of amazon india who spoke to us exclusively on the pivots which are at play as part of amazon's india strategy in these challenging times hi amit welcome to mints pivot or perish campaign which looks at how india inc is rethinking itself our focus today is e-commerce and with me is my co-host anil padmanabhan let me start the session by asking you something that your boss jeff bezo keeps talking about when something bad happens let it define you destroy you or strengthen you in many ways it echoes mint's pivot or perish campaign which is you pivot you perish or you empower yourself how would you look at it in the context of 2020 and thereafter well i think first of all uh, thanks for having me and i hope all of you are safe and healthy out there uh, these are really unprecedented times for all of us uh, and uh, and i and i appreciate uh, having the chance to talk to you guys um i think of this code in many different ways uh, personally i think it think about it for myself for my family for amazon for my employees we talk about it often uh, how this is a chance for us uh, we feel incredibly grateful in some sense and very responsible that we have a big role to play as amazon as as an e-commerce in this uh, world of social distancing and even later i think uh, the way we do our job the way we earn trust uh, of our customers of our selling partners of just this uh, of citizens and nation uh, is going to go a long way in shaping how amazon is going to be in 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 the post uh, covid world Hey, Amit, if I can jump in, uh, just you made a great point about how consumer behavior is uh, poised to change because uh, trust will be a key metric of this new behavior. So, you know, how do you, uh, because you're an e-commerce uh, business, how do you look at it? Because in many ways, your customer is not visible to you, just like you are not visible to the customer. so how do you build this element of trust over a platform like e-commerce i think uh, you know trust is a very uh, interesting thing uh, and, and again I'm, i'm probably being more philosophical it's not just e-commerce with anything uh, you earn trust uh, and you earn trust when you do the right thing even when no one is watching you you know it's very easy to do the right thing when people are watching you you know we uh, feel that uh, we make promises to our customers and we keep promises and that's how customers trust us we keep them in every single transaction 
that we have with them with every uh, every engagement we have with them for example the simple things on amazon you know if you place something in your cart and the price of it reduces we actually put a message of it saying that look the price of this has fallen down and and uh, and maybe the seller is just going to send you the balance money back to you uh, because you placed an order uh, order for this item yesterday or if you just go on amazon and let's say you've shopped for an item and you placed an order yesterday and you happen to come to the same page we actually have a small message at the top which says you've already purchased this item a different company might like the idea that you're going to buy that item again in accident we think that saving that trouble for you will go a long way to earn your trust you, you can still place the order but maybe you are just there by accident so i think these are small actions when customer is not really expecting that from you you do the small things and then there are bigger things you make promises that you're going to deliver the item on a certain date and you make sure that happens and we miss the promise uh, we actually make it a, a very important exercise within the company to drive a root cause find what went wrong fix that so that it never happens again uh, i think in the post covid world uh, customers are going to look for that trust the trust of safety the trust of having the items that they need delivered to them making sure that we hold ourselves to the promises that we make um, uh, those would be very very important Amit, one of the focal areas of Amazon, and you have been talking about it, is MSMEs or the small enterprises that make up your ecosystem. How has your strategy or your program to to scale them up changed in the world that we face now, which is the post-COVID world? Uh, are you going to speed up the whole idea of creating this ecosystem? Are you going to give them more resistance? Are you going to re-strategize? What is it that you're going to do? Uh, so our strategy has always been very focused on things that matter to customers. And we know that customers care about vast selection of products, uh, great, getting great value on them, and getting it delivered fast and reliably. And the way we make this happen is by providing tools to empower uh, hundreds and thousands of and millions globally of uh, selling partners, as we call them, so that they can offer anything that the customer wants. They can reduce cost of operations by using our technology and offer great value and use our logistics infrastructure to deliver it fast and reliably. That's kind of the core part of our business model. So if you think about the post-COVID world, uh, our core strategy of selection, price, and convenience is more relevant than ever before. Our core strategy of empowering um, uh, uh, selling partners to serve customers from the safety of their home is more relevant than ever before. So I would say that our strategy remains the same. I think the one nuance that uh, I would probably call out that this event or this crisis has brought to the fore is we have more than six lakh sellers in the Amazon marketplace. And if you went ahead and asked them, how do they use Amazon? I would bet that most of them use Amazon to expand their reach. So they want to reach out to customers they cannot reach today in their cashment, either regionally, nationally, or globally. I think with this crisis, they would want to use us to reach their customers even locally. Uh, just because of social distancing, footfalls uh, will have to be supplemented with an online presence. And that is one of the reasons why we accelerated one of the products we have been working on for a while. We had about 5,000 sellers in, uh, and pilot, which we call local shops on Amazon. And that gives you tools that are fine-tuned for allowing a seller to, uh, to service customers that otherwise would have walked into the store. So it's, it allows them to both serve in their store and to serve on Amazon. So I would point that out as an example of a more recent innovation to adjust our strategy a little bit, but the core element of the strategy remains the same. Amit, if I can just uh, follow up, you know, the uh, space that you're talked of, the six lakh vendors that you mentioned, they are the exactly the same people who have got squeezed, a sample of this people who got squeezed because of the demand uh, that has disappeared from the economy after the shutdown. 
So how has Amazon uh, dealt with this family of vendors, as it were? You know, how have you worked to kind of stabilize them and kind of hold them in there uh, till the crisis abates, or now that the lockdown is being wound down? Yeah, uh, I think it is. Uh, it, it is very, very uh, hard to imagine what they have been going through. Uh, you know, just being completely paused, disrupted for fifty plus days. Uh, is is very hard on any small business. Uh, you know, I think I would say the first segment of actions were very much in in order to make sure that uh, we we reduce the worry that they have. So you know, you know, many of them have products in warehouses or somewhere in the network. We wanted to make sure that they're not worried about cancellation fees. They're not worried about storage fees. We're not worried about uh, claims on their account because they haven't been able to deliver the product. So just just the basics so that we remove those worries. Uh, and trying to make sure that working capital is accessible to them. When they were able to start, we were in constant touch with our selling partners. And I'm really impressed the support that we got from them, appreciating why this is important for the nation, why they need to stand on the sidelines for a little bit, uh, uh, while we keep uh, our citizens safe, get the essentials to them. And the people who were uh, dealing with essentials were able to jumpstart their operations and start serving them because the lockdown allowed Amazon to provide essential products to customers. Now that the lockdown has uh, uh, given the much needed relief so that they can serve all products, we've done a few things. We have reduced their fees by 50% for a period of time so that they can actually get uh, relief for a longer period and while they get their business back into shape. We've, we've changed some of our policies like disbursement policies to be daily disbursements because we don't want their working capital to be held for any longer than a day uh, um, uh, even though their products may not have reached uh, yet. So we are trying to uh, improve the cycle of uh, capital rotation for them so that the working capital is taken care of. You know, we started picking from all their uh, uh, stores, uh, from their warehouses. So we actually hired thousands of seasonal workers to add more capacity dealing with some of the labor issues that we had to get them started so that they do not have to wait for fully productive capacity to be there in place. So I think these are some of the examples of actions uh, that we have taken. I think at the end of the day, sellers care about getting sales and getting their revenues back on track. And I'm very, very excited. When I just look at the first two days, you know, we are already seeing them, seeing anywhere from 50 to 100% uh, greater demand than pre-COVID. Uh, so clearly there is significant pent up demand. Clearly customers are looking to buy products that- I mean, they, you know, if you look at, uh the whole ecosystem that is evolving now, everyone's talking about the new normal. So asking a more larger macro question beyond just your line of business, how do you see this new normal play out for a country like India, where we have a lot of issues uh, relating to our ability to deliver hygiene, deliver safety, and all these related aspects. So how do you see as a larger, you know, big picture on in this scenario? So it is unprecedented for every nation out there. And, and I think for India, it, it gets very complex very quickly. I mean, we have a very high density of people. Uh, as you said, there are, uh, it, it's a very uh, vast country of many different uh, uh, cohorts of population and trying to get a singular message of safety, uh, a best practices out there uh, implemented consistently is not easy. And I, I'm, I'm pretty impressed uh, by uh, some of the discipline that has been shown uh, by, by all the citizens. But at the same time, we are also hearing about all the side effects of that. And it's a very hard balance to make, uh, keeping life safe and retaining livelihoods and retaining our economy. So it's a very tough spot, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's it's hard to figure out, but if I just take a bigger picture view, uh, you know, you have got to feel optimistic that we will come out stronger. You've got to feel positive that at the end of this, we will probably as a society be a lot more responsible, kind, grateful, uh, more resilient. And uh, we have shown this in the past. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I draw a lot of optimism from that. Um, uh, but right now, our topmost priority should be saving lives and saving livelihoods. Uh, I think from 
uh, for, again, sort of just bringing that big, big picture down to the area that I am involved in, I do feel e-commerce and Amazon has a role to play, a very important role to play to both keep life safe by meeting needs of customers at home and to jumpstart livelihoods uh, because it's the safest way that any, any business of any size in the nation can reach out to customers while adhering to the guidelines of safety and social distancing. And by the way, as we uh, look at this, I think there's a lot of opportunities that are going to be created. Uh, you know, we already are talking about healthcare more than we have before. Uh, you know, as we think about just manufacturing, uh, I think uh, India will benefit quite a bit uh, to in the long run as it as it tries to position itself as a very viable alternative for the world. And again, as Amazon, we have a product called Global Selling that precisely targets manufacturers in India to, who intend to take their products global. So we're very excited about that opportunity. Uh, uh, and and there would be a lot of innovation that could happen in the progress, uh, you know, in terms of how people think about brands and products uh, and new services. So I'm very optimistic. I think we have to be, be patient and see see this through. Uh, but it is a tough situation, and and it will require collective action. Amit, is here's a question that uh, I keep asking myself, and I think I should ask you because. Uh, both Jeff and you have been saying this. Uh, to innovate is to fail, and to fail is to innovate. Uh, how would that apply in uh, the current times that we are facing? Because unless you have a contrarian in the system, not just an innovator, you can't test a system, you can't test a business model. So how do you create the room for such creativity, which is a contrarian creativity to flourish. And you see that happening in the present times. I think uh, uh, it's it's a lot about the culture that you have in your organization. If it's kind of that's where you're going and, it, you know, people need to feel comfortable with the idea of being misunderstood. You know, when you when you when you think about innovation, you know, there are lots of different pieces that come together. You, you need to uh, you need to be very obsessed with your customers because that allows your innovation to have a, a real adoption. In my mind, you know, innovation is just an idea until a customer adopts it. So uh, working backwards from customers matters. Uh, you need to have a high degree of experimentation. Uh, so you need to figure out how, whether it's, it's, it's the nation or the organization or whatever you're doing, how do you reduce the cost of experimentation? It, it, ideas cannot take uh, massive efforts to experiment. Otherwise, you won't be able to fail quite a bit. Uh, at the same time, many of those experiments would fail because an experiment is really an experiment because you don't know the outcome. Uh, you, you can't really uh, uh, try otherwise. So you need to have a culture where it is perfectly normal for people to fail and be misunderstood. Uh, and, and that failure actually teach you things that you could learn from. Uh, we will come out stronger in areas such as healthcare that are really important for the growth of this country, manufacturing, healthcare, and so on. So I, I'm very optimistic that if you take a really long-term point of view, uh, uh, there would be many experiments that would happen as we kind of get ourselves adjusted to this normal. Many of them will fail. Many of them would succeed. Uh, we need to think long term. We, we should be OK with failure as a society right now. Um, and uh, and uh, innovation uh, would thrive during this period. I, I, I think we were talking about the cohort of small businesses. I think they have a big choice in front of them. This is the time to embrace technology. This is the time to not get worried about access points of offline or online. This is a time to ask yourself, how do I serve my customers? Customers don't really care where your selection is available. They just want you to provide great selection, great value, and great convenience. And they would access you wherever you are. Uh, so I think these are the kinds of innovations that would happen that might permanently change how certain businesses come out stronger. Um, and I'm very optimistic about it, personally. Amit, one last question before we conclude. And uh, up front, let me thank you for joining the main campaign and uh, giving your views and enriching the campaign that we have triggered off 
uh, in the hope of finding better solutions for India Inc. So before we conclude, here's the question that when I started uh, and spoke about Jeff Bezos and the idea of defining yourself or strengthening yourself or destroying yourself, are uh, defining yourself or redefining yourself and strengthening yourself uh, two complementary ideas or they they are opposites. Uh, do you, you can only strengthen your core, but to redefine, you need to think of something different altogether. Would you like to shed light on that? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, we talked about innovation. Uh, 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 you, you know, many of the things that we talk about, I mean, just as society, right? I mean, uh, we could just redefine ourselves as a society and how we, uh, think about uh, respect and gratefulness as an example. I mean, uh, uh, even the last 55 days of shutdown, I'm sure all of us have probably asked ourselves, do we really need to consume so much? Uh, and, and what's the right responsible consumption? You know, how could we help other people? So I think just as, as human beings, uh, there's a lot of things that uh, we might be thinking about that would redefine who we are. Uh, same with companies. And I was I was listening to somebody's interview about uh, the airline industry in India, and and the person said, uh, you know, there is this group that is thinking about freight because that's more important than passenger travel right now, and and they're re re really redefining themselves in the short term as a freight business. Uh, so I think that kind of uh, flexibility, uh, uh, you know, uh, is important. Uh, to both come out stronger. And, and, and by the way, in this process, they would find uh, that they are able to look at cost structures in different ways that makes them a better airline uh, when they do come out norm, uh, to be normal through this experience. So I think coming out stronger, uh, uh, trying out uh, you know, completely different ideas that are really driven by the current crisis where your customers need you could just redefine who you are. And as far as Amazon goes, we are really hopeful that an idea like local shops would help the local stores redefine themselves from being either an offline store or a corner store to just be a place that serves customers, uh, no matter where the customers are. And I feel that that kind of embracing the technology uh, might just completely leapfrog the whole uh, idea of whether something is online and offline to uh, being a customer obsessed uh, business. Uh, we are very optimistic that uh, manufacturers might just embrace things like global selling and just redefine themselves as global brands uh, because uh, they would think of this as a great opportunity for them to serve the whole world, not just India, as they think about dealing with the constraint of lower footfalls in India for the short term. So I think there are constraints, there are challenges, but there are opportunities hidden in those challenges. And I feel the people who would actually look out for those opportunities, embrace them, accept the normal, uh, but be resilient, uh, embrace the opportunity, go after it, at the end of the day will come out significantly stronger. And, and when this all is dusted and done, it would be because we will have a vaccine. So the good news is there is, a, there is an end date to this. It's not something that we have to live forever. Uh, uh, the choices that we make in the next few months are really going to define who we are as individuals, as society, as organization, as business, and as a nation. Thank you, Amit. Thank you on behalf of Team Mint and the campaign Pivot of Parish. And we wish you and Team Amazon all the best. Thank you. Thank you and stay safe and healthy. Um, so that was uh, Amazon's Amit Agarwal sharing his insight on what businesses can possibly do to tackle the crisis. He said that it is perfectly fine to be misunderstood. We will continue the conversation with our guests here this evening. And on that note, let me bring in Vinay again to take the conversation ahead. So let me say that we are very glad to have the guests here. And I'm looking forward to a lot of ideas. So let me first go to Meena. And uh, as a serial entrepreneur with a very high risk appetite, I would want to ask her that, is this going to be the era of the cautious entrepreneur? 
or the reluctant entrepreneur? That's a very good question, Vinay. Um, what I'd like to perhaps take one step back and say, um, all these changes that we are seeing, what does it mean for an entrepreneur? Uh, what is the expectation that the board, the investors and the world as such have from an entrepreneur? How has that changed? And then we'll talk about what is uh, what how the risk appetite of an um, entrepreneur or of an investor is changing. So if you look at till recently, um, an entrepreneur um, has been lauded for their ability to think completely out of the box, for being very aggressive in growth, for growth at, at all costs, for finding newer and newer um, uh, horizons to conquer, so literally to be the warrior and uh, Alexander the Great and going and conquering new uh, new regions is what the expectation from an uh, entrepreneur is. But that I think uh, currently what we the the, uh, the crisis that we are facing is obviously uh, showing as a mirror that this is not what we need from an entrepreneur now. So the entrepreneur, the leader. And which I am, and um, while I may have also be a, um, a promoter in a number of other companies, but I lead my company, Portia Medical, as an entrepreneur, as a CEO. So I know from both the perspectives that today the expectation is, uh, in many sectors, is how do you minimize your um, uh, minimize your burn? How do you make sure that you can survive? How do you make sure that as the changes in customer behavior, customers' requirement environment come about, how do you still remain relevant to the population or to the target audience that you are serving or are there new um, new target audiences and new solutions that you need to come, come up with. So the expectation from the entrepreneur has changed drastically, um, which requires that the, as an investor, as a board member, you provide appropriate support to the entrepreneur to now learn, in some cases, learn these new skills because they haven't been in this kind of situation. Some of the more seasoned entrepreneurs, uh, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur for 30 years and I've gone through cycles, I've gone through companies which ran out of money, I've gone through 9-11, I've gone through uh, 2008, so I've gone through multiple challenges. So some degree of maturity is there, but somebody who's just been on the go, go, go um, kind of a growth path and needs to really sit back and say, now what do you do when things don't really go, go, go in the growth path? So, that, there is a, there's something that all of us have to sit and take a little bit of a breather and say, what is the right thing to do in this kind of new life? Uh, let me flip uh, Vinay's question. A lot of people are also saying that this is also an opportunity. I mean, the, the regular, you know, I mean, the argument that I face, I, I hear every day is, you know, the big will only get bigger. Also, is this an opportunity for you? I want you to answer this and maybe the other panelists can also join in. Sure. It's a great Absolutely. thing. There is an opportunity in every crisis and this should not be known. No, no doubt about that. So I'll talk a little bit from the healthcare sector, what I see as the opportunity. Um, and and uh, as Portia Medical, we work in the outside of hospital healthcare. So we are literally working with patients and the, their families at their homes and provide all kinds of support uh, through either directly to them at their homes or through technology or any other ways in which we can support them. So now suddenly the the there is a huge change from facility-based care as being the gold standard and people wanting to go into a facility for each and everything. People are really, really taking two, two or three thoughts before they go into a facility because of all that we know. I mean, I don't need to spell out why. It's quite obvious that nobody needs wants to go to a facility unless there is no other choice. Now, this, is, this could lead to a fundamental change in behavior and we are seeing that already. People are our customers and a lot of other uh, um, people that I've spoken to talk about their customers are very willing to look at now technology-based uh, healthcare, willing to look at devices that they're in, willing to have community-based healthcare, are willing to do, and we are doing some things which you would have never had dreamt. For instance, carrying out chemotherapy administration at home was something that we always felt is a is something is the ideal, is, the, is something you could reach there. And that's something which is a real change in what the customer's behavior is and what the value that they are getting. They're seeing ask for that. They're seeing people actually pushing us to provide them there. So suddenly in the sector of healthcare, I'm seeing that remote healthcare, uh, digital, uh, technology-led, um, uh, community-led, these are some things which have come in, which were not some which were not absolutely top of the mind in the healthcare sector. 
The other thing that it also means while I'm talking about these changes, and it is not something which can be done by an individual company. Well, I agree, it is it is a benefit to some of the bigger players, but it's not a single player, it's not a single kind of company that would uh, benefit from this, but it's a consortium that different kinds or different elements of healthcare need to come together and provide the most appropriate solution to the consumer. So yes, absolutely, there are opportunities in this um, Time, for sure. Hari, let me go to you now. I mean, you have uh, seen many ups and downs, inflection points. You are uh, very seasoned entrepreneur. Uh, you know, in many ways, uh, we have seen since 2008 and before that, that we have managed inflection points or entrepreneurs have managed inflection points uh, rather well. What were your thoughts, uh, Hari, on when uh, the virus hit us? Uh, do you, did you think that you needed to pivot? Did you think that you needed to overreact, under underreact, or do you, did you think that you needed to exercise restraint? When the virus, you know, first hit, you know, we uh, we were first the first thing that we were thinking about was safety, right? Uh, you know, in the sense that you know we need to make sure that. Uh, you know, all of us first, first, first get very safe, right? Uh, um, us meaning us and and, and my entire, you know, uh, set of employees. Uh, you know, twenty five thousand of them. And so, what what do we first do to make sure that happens, right? At that point in time, we had no clue, uh, frankly, on what the impact on business would be, right? All we knew is that people would need food, right, for sure. Uh, and 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 there is some way that you would have to, you know, you know, kind of be in there. But we had no clue in what form. So the first thing that hit us was safety. So we quickly reorganized ourselves. You know, work from home was the first thing that you know that came to our minds wherever possible. And we actually got to do that very very early, right? Uh, so sometime mid March, we we completely co- took that call and moved and moved uh, uh, a lot of our stuff to to work from home. But however, you know, our our our, uh, our, our operations can't do that. You, know, you can't sit at home and and deliver. So we had to uh, you know just do all of that. And interestingly, you know, twenty um, first. Uh, I still remember this. Uh, you know, it was it was crazy. So twenty first March uh, uh, was the D day. Uh, in the evening, we suddenly started getting a whole host of notifications from the government. Uh, you know, saying that uh, you know uh, tomorrow is the. And of course, the Prime Minister spoke a little later that that uh, that there would be a you know um, you know a semi lockdown uh, kind of condition tomorrow, um, and uh, you would have to deliver. Right, uh, you know, you're you're categorized under what's called essential services, and hence uh, you'll have to go out there and 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 actually deliver. So we were actually actually pretty thrilled, and you know, we were we were just hoping that something like that happens. We had no clue, uh, but then you know, uh, I will I will not go into the in, into the whole bit that you know actually what happened. If you know, people were so charged, we actually rallied people on that on that Saturday evening. Actually, frankly, I myself got on to speaking to each of my regional heads, got them to speak to everybody, saying, coming tomorrow to work, right? In spite of all this worries that, that, that we have is, is national pride, right? And, and it, it's, it's almost like, like a duty that I think you must all take on on yourselves because, you know, while the country is going to kind of shut down that day, you are going to be out there, uh, you know, delivering groceries to people. People are panicking. People are worried. You know, people are wondering what's going to happen. You know, unbelievable. People just rallied, actually. You know, uh, and and on at six in the morning on that Sunday, twenty second, we had one of our best attendants, right? Uh, uh, you know, everybody just came to warehouse, uh, you know, and said, "This is this is a great moment." And it was so nice to see that. What happened for four hours after that was sad, actually. You know, and that is where uh, you know, frankly, uh, at one point, uh, two days later, I. Frankly, all of us in our management team didn't know what could happen to us, right? And we absolutely had no clue on whether we would ever recover from, from what we saw over those three days. Actually, what happened was people went out, there was that communication didn't go to the ground. You know, a lot of our people, there were atrocities, they got beaten up, you know, uh, in, in addition to the fear that was there. And in about two hours on that Sunday, we were, we were, uh, we were pretty, pretty much shut, right? Because everybody had to be called back. Because people on the ground wouldn't let us uh, deliver, in spite of very, very clear instructions from the from the government. And that evening, actually, people clapped for us. You know, uh, people actually, uh, 
you know, clap for health workers, clap for delivery boys and stuff like that. And I was just looking back and saying, hey, you know, uh, this is what happened during the day. And 23rd, 24th, uh, 80% of our people went away. 80% of, of the workforce went away. Because that time the borders were open because the lockdown was announced on 25th. So that window of 23rd, 24th, they went away. And that was a moment which was scary, right? Frankly, absolutely scary. We were down to 20% of our workforce, down to, uh, you know, just about somehow delivering 25,000 orders from a peak of 150,000 orders. Uh, frankly, you know, I had no clue on what's going to happen next. Absolutely no clue. Uh, well, what happened was a very different story. You know, I think the way the government kind of reacted, absolutely outstanding, outstanding, I must say, because, you know, they got us up and running in two days flat. Two days flat. All that we were doing is sitting in meetings with, with very, very senior people, including the ministers sitting there and taking decisions across the board. Across the board. And they would take a decision and it would get implemented in a few hours. And that was just outstanding. And we scaled after that, so there was no looking back. Extremely scary, uncertain 15th March to 31st March. Frankly, I didn't know what's going to happen to our business. So, Hari, here is a quick question for you. Uh, we love our customers a lot. And uh, we also love our employees. And maybe our love for customers is probably slightly more than our love for employees. Uh, we do see the tilt happening now where that the love for employees also goes up more than probably the love for customers. Do you see that? Actually, actually, I, first of all, I, we, we never saw it that way, right? For us, our customers and employees, uh, you know, uh, have always been at a, you know, at a, at a, at a similar level. Because, you know, I... If you, if you don't have happy, good employees, you know, no matter what you want to do with your customers, it's not going to work, right? So, so, so you need to keep them on the same, at the same level. You can't, you can't distinguish, you know, that. However, yes, of course, we all say customer is king, customer is important and stuff like that and, and tend to kind of display, uh, you know, uh, larger, uh, you know, passion or love for them. Uh, frankly, uh, you know, it's not changed too much except the fact that Safety, as far as employees are concerned, is, was very, very important. You know, the important thing is it's not customer versus employee. It is employee versus business, right? And that is where, you know, we, you know, we made a big difference. And, and we were very clear in every communication of mine to the region, starting from March and even as of, as of yesterday, is that one communication that went across clearly is that your safety is more important to us than business, right? If there is somebody falling sick, if there is somebody, you know, showing symptoms, you know, taking care of you is more important rather than delivering the order which you would have done that day. And that was a clear message. So the difference was that it was safety versus business and not safety versus customer. Because the customer, we would always go back and make sure that he's informed, he's told. And customers understand, you know, at the end of the day, right? Because you're going through a, a pandemic, you're going through a, a, a crazy situation, which is why customers don't want urgent deliveries anymore. All they want is a good delivery, which means a delivery with high fill rate. They're willing to wait. They're saying, just make sure you deliver what we order. Just make sure you deliver quality to us. And that's more important. As against wanting it in one hour and express and faster and slower and, and you know, all that. So customers understand, right? And so getting back to customers was, so, it, so to me, it was prioritizing the employee over business. And that continues today. And that was more important to us. No, very, very interesting points uh, there, Hari. So let's, uh, on that note, like a lot of... Uh, lot of these things possible. I'm, I'm sure you have your own backend, but for many companies, it's, it's, it's the guys like delivery who be, make the business possible, you know, in times like this. Mohit, how was your experience in this whole situation? Our experience, uh, I just wanted to say, you know, uh, 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 what Ravi mentioned, right, I would echo his thought is that, you know, the trajectory was very simple, right, was very similar uh, that we had. Um, 25th, the lockdown started, right, and uh, at that time, basically, all our physical uh, stuff. And Challenging time. So, were, were there things that you had to do differently to make things happen? That has also evolved over the period. So, the first thing that we had to do was that, you know, uh, while most of our network pre-lockdown is essential commodity, right? Whether it's with pharma, we, uh, we probably pharma, pharma companies and SMC companies in the matter of a week to understand where their cold boxes, uh, creating those cold boxes to move vaccines across the country, right? Uh, for critical supply with a lot of FAs basically on our hands, right? Um, so when stuff goes to the distributor and from distributor basically were completely shut, right? So the FMCG supplies even to the retailer were basically becoming a bigger body, right? 
that stuff out uh, out to the retailers right uh, not again something that we were doing earlier uh, but again we pulled our network to actually cater to those guys right so it was not just about e-commerce but basically other sectors and how do you help them uh, within the governments for example uh, pharmacy uh, you know their basically demands were very high and pharmacies were not equipped to right now manage that kind of order volume right? for that one month of entire april right we were the only logistics com- b2c logistics company which were operating across the country right so how do you actually move medicines basically for those pharma companies and vaccines also uh, or for example insulin for them which required some sort of cold storage uh, or ambient temperature right uh, across the cities so we told the network to actually get to those kind of things you know and now actually when things have settled down more from a basic requirement perspective i think most of april was basically consumed by ensuring that you know uh, pharmacy items and fmcg essentials are moving across the country right that is where basically a big part of our focus was uh, to rebuild the network right now it's more about you know uh, how do you get uh, more of these non essential commodities also to, to the customer base right as everybody is talking about right that now e-commerce is going to be the go to for everything that you need right people will prefer basically that you know things get delivered to their home um, uh, as much as possible right and one fundamental shift that we are seeing now is that instead of uh, and amit also spoke about it uh, briefly is that uh, apart from the traditional marketplace and warehouse model where you know to basically create a reach across the country right there is a lot of local demand now which is coming in where you need to fulfill them locally right so hyper local delivery is becoming uh, a, a sort of a, a bigger sort of a uh, part of our business now right so how do you do 2 or 4 or 6 or same day delivery hyper local delivery at a cost which is basically viable for the retailer also right how do you do more local shipping so retooling the network retooling the tech infrastructure to actually basically be able to get to do that right so that is becoming also important uh, pivot for us now going forward right not just with retailers but working directly with fmc companies to reach out to uh, to their consumers or to retail shops across Amar, let me draw you into the conversation. I mean, was this a big inflection point for for you? What happened at the end of March? Do you think it's going to influence your business in any way? I mean, or is it a blip which you think uh, we have kind of overcome? I mean, I uh, we do believe this is an infle- inflection point for e-commerce. This is not just a blip, um, but it can be a blip if we don't actually. act on how do we make e-commerce more relevant to the consumer um for a very long time e-commerce followed a certain model uh, while the consumer is at the center of every product thinking wave ever day more than ever it, the consumer centric thought process has to be much more prevalent um than it was ever before especially when um the e-commerce always came with a set of apprehension uh, in terms of especially in terms of fashion it's an area where uh, most of uh, our consumer base was not comfortable trying a new brand new style even though they are the consumers forget about the uh, the non customers of uh, the e-commerce even the consumers who were already shopping online had their apprehension buying a different brand different style because it always comes with a upbeat size and fit issue we don't know how i mean the size chart is not standard between the brand um the the information is not detailed enough between the brand so there are many things now those apprehensions are overshadowed by the safety and the health uh, concerns of uh, or or the uh, inhibition or the apprehension of going out to a mass shopping area at this moment um and in this is the time when we need to actually step up our game on how do we uh, augment some of the behaviors that were demonstrated in the offline space like for in fact we have expedited a lot of our investments we've been doing for a long time um so i think it is one big example we've been uh, in the business for the last 10 years and more than any uh, other retailer um kind of fashion consumption data we have it's good enough for us to actually start working on this model we've been working on this model since i think you know a pilot on the platform for last four to five months we've expanded some of these investments where we can give the conference to consumer that this is the size you should be trying in this new brand new size even when we don't have a previous purchase information of that consumer in that brand size uh coming to the supply chain side of things um Uh, the way we've actually been rethinking our supply chain during this time, uh, 
In fact, what we've done in the last few weeks um, of how to make these, the whole process a contactless process. They, uh, they, in fact, we were one of the first to say that we will not ring the doorbell. We took away the, the need for signature. Uh, we got the uh, contactless payment, the UPI-based payment method, where people don't have to uh, get in contact with our delivery guy. And this is this is actually going back to the earlier question you asked about who do you put first, is the employee or uh, the consumer? My answer has uh, always been, and this is one of the first things I answer to my organization also, there is one more uh, set of people that we need to be responsible for, which is our vendors and partners. So for us as a business, for us as an organization, employees, our consumers, and our partners are equally important. And we don't believe we can be successful uh, by prioritizing one over the other. It has to come together. And uh, the way we've been working with all the three parties, when we are one of the first companies to going to work from home, and we've been working, we've been working from home for most of the organization ever since, um, except the, uh, the 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 critical functions which have to have have to have a physical presence in the location are the only ones. And even in those locations, the amount of uh, the rigor we are putting to the SOP, uh, I mean the SOPs we have right now in terms of social distancing norms. Uh, in terms of all the local innovations we made on how do we keep people hygiene safe and more importantly, um, how do they get back home safe? It's not just about their time in our facility, it's also about their commute time. Um, in terms of our consumers, we did a proactive communication during uh, the first lockdown that, um, sorry, we cannot be, uh, we won't be able to uh, um, deliver your products and you're free to cancel your orders and you will be surprised. 91% of them said no, keep it the way it is and we will wait for our orders. That also gave us the confidence that uh, we've built loyalty over a period of time and there is a need uh, or there is a demand that is not going to die down any time. With respect to our partners, uh, there are a lot of small medium uh, businesses who uh, uh, do business on our platform. We are activated marketplace at the end of the day. Uh, and we also have a quite extensive network of delivery boys. Uh, we call it a mentor partner. Again, I don't know how much you're familiar about this network. This is a network of a small medium businesses, with Kirana stores, mom and pop stores, who also do deliveries for us during their downtime. Unfortunately, during the lockdown time, uh, their primary business was also shut, and uh, we didn't have any delivery for them to uh, earn any money. So we are probably one of the first organizations, if not the only organization, which advanced uh, the payment to them, to, to our partners. They kind of got a payroll uh, advance so that they can survive this uh, downtime. In addition to that, we were we also got them COVID insurance, you know, um, which was anyway given to all our employees, to be extended to our partners in the small medium business. So the amount of effort or the amount of uh, investment we made into uh, all these things uh, is, the only reason behind that is we need to safeguard our employees, we need to retire our business, and we need to reimagine the business. Going back to your first uh, question that you asked, we believe is an inflection point, and we believe all these steps that we are making today uh, will actually help us come out of this stronger. And uh, the way we actually see this going forward is, I know a lot of people have been talking about post-COVID, post-COVID, but I do believe that we are going to be in the COVID world for a very, very long time. And that's how we are seeing the business. And in that COVID world, uh, the digital business have to uh, has a bigger role to play. And uh, we are actually fortunate to be uh, uh, well positioned to play that role in this country right now. No, I mean very valid points. Uh, uh, very valid points, Summer. Um, I just I have, a, I have a, I'm I'm curious. Uh, of course, we we are all doing our basic hygiene checks, making sure our employees are fine, our supply chains are fine. How are we dealing with consumer behavior? For example, I'm curious to know if, you know, now with the lockdowns being extended, uh, are you focusing more on, say, homeware uh, instead of, you know, high fashion, which has traditionally been your key focus area? Are you are you doing these kind of things, these innovations? Sir? Sure. So, uh, actually, let me uh, take you guys to the day uh, Hari was mentioning about the day before the lockdown was announced. Uh, we were already in work, uh, work from home mode by then. Uh, we didn't know what was the kind of impact that was coming to the business. When the lockdown was an, uh, announced, um, by then we were already deep into protecting our employees, making sure they're all safe. Wherever they are, some of them were traveling, so we made sure all those employees are back to their home places or whatever place they call home and they're close with their relatives and uh, whatever we could do as an organization. Very quickly, we realized that we don't have much bigger role to play 
in this lockdown when the focus is actually on the essential. Um, and the the one question that I was getting from the organization is, is there something we can do? Is there something we can do? And Hari, uh, uh, I don't know many people know this. We were this close to actually launching Rossi on Winter because we thought it's something we can do at this time. And then we realized uh, our friends at Big Basket and Flipkart are doing a better job than us, and let's not get into it. Um, but when uh, we started actually looking at um, how our own uh, uh, employees in our XPs were having a hard time getting the mask, protective uh, gear, that's when we realized if a company of this size is having a hard time getting this equipment, what about consumers? So we quickly partnered with all the brands, uh, starting with the Wildcraft to every major brand in the country right now. We talent all the way to uh, UCB, I mean, you name it. Everybody stepped in and started making masks and protective equipment. And we started, uh, we restarted our business with protective equipment. And uh, and the way we actually served it, and in fact, uh, um, Mohit, uh, Mohit, Mohit and team helped us a lot during those times. So delivery was our delivery partner where we could actually get this mask out there to the demand. And very quickly we realized uh, the, the way people are spending their time at home and spending their time in front of a computer doing their work is changing. It, it's much different from the way it was before. And there is much bigger need for this new thing called fashion essential. Your lounge wear, your leisure wear, your leisure wear. Again, we reached out to uh, the partners. And uh, our partners, uh, like always, have been very, very supportive uh, to help us with the supply. And uh, we came up with the work, work from home essentials. We came up with fashion essentials, which also gave us some kind of runway for us to stay relevant. And uh, also during this time, one of the uh, things that uh, uh, our teams have done a phenomenal job of transforming Mintra into a content destination. We put out a lot of content on the uh, Mintra platform about how you can actually uh, stay fit at home, how you can, uh, I mean, it's a do it uh, DIY videos about how you can apply beauty products, how you can take care of kids, how you can do yoga, a lot of stuff. And we have a lot of influencers on the platform. We have celebrities who have always been working with Mintra. They also put out a lot of content on the platform. And uh, the kind of engagement we saw, uh, our traffic was quickly up to half of what it was uh, during one of the best days in February, uh, especially when we had nothing to offer in terms of fashion. It was just essential. And the amount of time that was being spent on the platform was almost the same as what it was uh, pre-COVID. So people were very engaged with this content. This also gave us confidence that based on all of these data signals, we realized that this is what users are expecting from us. We quickly uh, kind of gave that information to our brands, our in-house brands to act on it. And now uh, we've been operational for the last three, uh, four days uh, with the new relaxation coming in. And uh, there is so much of pent up demand in the country. And uh, we've, been, uh, we've been very busy in the last four days and uh, happy to be busy. You can't even complain. I mean, it's not going to complain. They have to be busy. And, uh, and yeah, it, it's, been a, it's been a very educating journey for us more than anything. Hearing all of you, and uh, understanding that all of you were kind of experienced the inflection point. Here's what I would like to ask, and anyone in the panel can answer this. Is the era of Jugaad over? Are we only going to not talk of pivot, not Jugaad? Quickly validating your uh, thought process or your solution. I think what is fundamentally changing right now is you don't have to search for a problem set. The problem statements are quite obvious right in front of you and uh, the kind of uh, uncertainty we are seeing and the kind of chaos that we are in right now, all of this actually breeds opportunity. They have always bred opportunity and this is, this is no different. And if we act on this opportunity and if, and this is the time for the organizations to bear um, the time and cost to correct themselves uh, and question the traditional way of doing things, I can speak, of, speak on behalf of fashion industry. Uh, for a very long time, the leaders in the fashion industry have been talking about how their traditional way of manufacturing is not beneficial, both financially and even for the environment. I mean, there's a seasonal way of manufacturing fashion. And that happens like six months before or even eight months before the season really hits the, uh, the market with almost no input from the market or the consumer feedback, which is the reason why there is a 30 to 40 percent of uh, overproduction happening in fashion industry today. If you can imagine, this is a $2.5 trillion uh, market, I mean, $2.5 trillion uh, industry, and 30, 30 to 40% of overproduction, 
going into landfill financially and more importantly and not environment friendly uh, and when this pandemic hit us it actually hit us in the month of february which is considered to be a fashion month especially in europe so most of the brands could not order from the the, the runway show on what they should be ordering for the next year it gave the time for them to take a pause to re look at how the fashion can course correct the way it has been manufactured things we don't have to over produce we can actually produce on demand which is where players like us can help our brand and that's exactly what happened in last 6 7 weeks we saw the demand for masks we reached out to the brand we saw the demand for fashion essentials we reached out to the brand none of those brands are sitting with excess inventory right now because we were we were not only helping them with what what needs to be made we were also helping them how much to make and this is what a future of uh, a fashion industry could be and i believe this is same for every industry this pandemic did not need any industry um, on its way so that's what i believe if we have reached the concluding part of this webinar i would like to thank all of you and we are proud to have you uh, as a journalist i would specifically want to thank all the entrepreneurs because when we when we do stories we realize that the only guys who have a better idea what the future is going to be like are the entrepreneurs because they put their money and life on it so just follow the entrepreneur thank you for guiding us journalists and being here on the mid pivot operation webinar thank you very much